Hey everyone, Stu Mashwitz here, coming to you live, pre-recorded from my uh, home studio here where usually I'm uh, all by myself staring endlessly at a computer all day long without ever leaving, but these days I'm uh, all by myself uh, without anybody around staring at a computer. Um, so yeah, we're all kind of stuck here and uh, trying to figure out ways to be creative and stay sane. And the folks at Red Giant came up with a fun little project to help us do that. But before I go into that, so like I say, my name is Stu Mashwitz. My background is that I got an animation degree at CalArts, and this was right around the time that Jurassic Park had just happened and Industrial Light and Magic was crewing up like crazy. So I got my first job right out of film school at ILM, total dream job, did animation and lighting on all kinds of cool movies, and um, ultimately, even while I was there at ILM, kind of fused my love of kind of scrappy indie uh, DIY filmmaking uh, with my love of doing visual effects for big movies and helped create a group there called the Rebel Mac Unit that was, uh, you know, instrumental in doing the visual effects for Star Wars Episode One, uh, Galaxy Quest, Men in Black, a bunch of fun projects there. Our success with that approach of kind of using off-the-shelf hardware to do uh, ILM quality visual effects uh, led us to uh, me and a couple other uh, ILM veterans to quit our jobs at ILM and start our own visual effects company called The Orphanage. And at The Orphanage, we worked on a bunch of great movies, did a bunch of really fun stuff, kept going with the filmmaking side of it. That's where I started doing a lot of commercial directing. Uh, I wrote a book called The DV Rebel's Guide about indie action filmmaking. And that was also where I created Magic Bullet, which started as kind of a technical frame rate conversion tool for video and turned into a kind of flagship color correction tool. Uh, if you guys know me at all from being online, you know that I've got a blog at prolost.com and I'm pretty vocal on Twitter and big part of kind of the filmmaking community when it comes to that continuum. And I see it as a real smooth continuum between scrappy independent you know, modestly budgeted productions and big high-end fun visual effects and everything in between. Uh, my real passion is making all of that stuff accessible for, for everyone. And that's what led me to join up with Red Giant and start making filmmaking tools here. And then of course, we've recently joined forces with Maxon. And so now our arsenal of awesome filmmaking tools is just only growing. Uh, it's a really exciting time. And just as it's all getting going, all of a sudden we're all stuck inside. So at Red Giant, there's this wonderful tradition at the uh, offices in Portland, Oregon, especially there's a wonderful tradition of Nerf dart battles. Uh, in fact, uh, the minute that the CEO of uh, Maxon walked into the Red Giant offices for the first time, he was immediately pelted uh, <laughs> with, uh, with Nerf darts. And uh, now that office is sitting empty while everyone's working from home. In fact, most of us work remotely and uh and now we've got a whole bunch of new awesome folks that we're working with all over the world so we decided to stage a virtual nerf battle Oh man, so fun. So as soon as this kind of challenge came in, you know, it was a very simple thing. It was just like, hey, if you got a moment, just, you know, film yourself uh, firing a Nerf dart at your screen. Don't, don't break your computer. It would be a bad time to 
break your computer. And, uh, and as soon as that challenge came in, uh, this, this bug kind of triggered in me, which is that I have been wanting to figure out a way to do the DV Rebel version of Bullet Time. Now, Bullet Time was kind of popularized by The Matrix, of course. And this is the shot that I think everyone thinks of. There were examples of it before this, but of course this is really where it kind of became an indelible part of, you know, what we think of when we think of action filmmaking. And now this kind of slow motion camera whipping around stuff is, you know, table stakes for any action movie, whether there's a good reason for it, like there was in this one or not. So how do you rip off bullet time while you are home alone? Well, in the original Matrix, the way they did this was they used an array of still cameras. If you fire all of those still cameras at once, you can freeze the motion. But if you fire them in sequence, you get the effect of a camera moving around the subject way, way, way faster than it ever could uh, if it was a physical camera. And that's exactly what they did. They fired off all these cameras in sequence and got a series of still images, which they then had to do a ton of additional manipulation, interpolation to generate additional frames and additional 3D visual effects on top of to create this kind of signature moment. So the basic premise of bullet time, however you accomplish it, is that the camera is moving much faster than the action it's photographing. And the idea is to kind of simulate a camera move that is kind of a typical camera move and then action that has sort of anime timing that is independent of that camera move. There have been some really fun attempts to try this, especially now that, you know, high speed cameras are a little bit more commoditized, right? If you can just run a camera at a really, really high frame rate and move it really, really fast, you can get a nice kind of junior bullet time effect. A lot of folks have experimented with this. You know, Mark Rober rigged up something on YouTube with a ceiling fan. This other guy here uh, built uh, an elaborately engineered spinning rig with a camera at the end of it. Uh, some of my favorite have just been folks pointing high-speed cameras out of fast-moving trains. I really love this uh, example here shot in Tokyo. Now, the crazy thing that, of course, has happened since all of these examples is that our ridiculous telephones that we carry around with us everywhere we go have become like incredibly powerful filmmaking and production tools. And, you know, the iPhone 11 Pro can shoot 240 frames per second in decent looking full HD. And, and I think this is kind of critical for this type of shot, has a crazy wide angle lens. So I'm thinking I've kind of maybe got the tools that I need to finally kind of test out my idea of how to experiment with bullet time. My, uh, my first test was just <laughs> based on something I had seen where someone did it on a spinning chair. Uh, it, it actually works surprisingly well. Um, it only works for things that you can kind of manipulate from above um, because of the nature of the chair being kind of the device, but uh, uh, it also made a big mess. And uh, as I was cleaning up the mess, I had a little bit of an inspiration for maybe how I could pull this off. Now, the important thing to remember here is that not only am I trapped uh, alone in my home studio here without any kind of real resources or help, uh, I'm also incredibly lazy about this kind of stuff. Like, honestly, even if we weren't under a shelter in place order right now, I, I probably would still uh, pretend like I was and do this in the laziest way possible. So, uh, I'm sitting here pushing the broom around, sweeping up this water I cleaned up, and I realized that, uh, that the broom itself is actually the missing ingredient. So I grabbed a uh, good old-fashioned C-stand, essential filmmaking tool, and clamped the broom into it, uh, loosened up the top of it, and spun it around, and it was looking pretty plausible. Uh, my little uh, Joby Gorilla Pod and my... Um, uh, glyph from Studio Neat with its beautiful little wooden handle turned into kind of the perfect tool for uh, clamping onto the end of the broom. And I could give it a little spin, could spin it pretty fast and uh, shoot at 240 frames per second with my iPhone. Early test of this uh, went okay. Uh, a couple false starts, but promising.
So let's get to work. So I moved the situation over to my computer. And part of the premise of this is that in my studio, like an arm of a C stand directly in the shot is not really something you're going to notice because that kind of garbage is lying around here all over the place. And uh, so I shoved it over next to the computer, uh, spun it around, gave it a couple tests, and then started to figure out how I would uh, kind of choreograph out my little shot. So uh, I wound up shooting about, uh, I think, five takes of this, uh, different speeds, different attempts, different degrees of injuring myself. Uh, the fifth take was the second best. Uh, the third take was actually the best. And uh, here it is. Now, of course, I forgot to actually set up a witness cam to catch my heroic take here, but luckily for me, my Nest cam was going at the time, so I got this grainy little version of it. So uh, here's how uh, lame it looks in real time. Now, here's the deal. When you got a movie like this uh, shot on your iPhone, there's a few different ways to get it off the, the phone. Um, but uh, the way I do it, because I've got my iPhone synced with my computer via iCloud Photo Library, I think is what that's called, is um, with that photo selected, you go up here to File, you do Export, and you do Export Unmodified Original for one video. And that's going to give you actually the original high quality version of that video. And when you go and import that into After Effects, here's what that looks like. So it comes in at, well, let's see, 1920 by 1080, 240.2 frames per second. And it's uh, this H. EVC codec or whatever, which uh, luckily After Effects can actually read. So you can actually read the original thing. Now, what I did with this to make it easier to work on it, it there's a couple ways you could do this. You could decide that the canonical frame rate, like you could decide that time is time and you could work at 240 frames per second or whatever. I decided to interpret footage and set it to 23.976 frames and that means that if I just drop it in and hit play every frame is going to be represented here and basically instead of time being time kind of slow-mo is the canonical time and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do all of my visual effects work in this slow motion time and then in my very last stage of the shot I'm going to add some retiminess of it. If you, it's funny when you go back to photos and you just watch this video, you can see the influence of the Matrix and other films on how Apple chooses to represent this. You know, they know that shooting in slow motion is not nearly as, or watching a whole clip playback in slow motion is not nearly as fun as watching it be in real time, go into slow motion for just the right part of the shot, and then spring out of slow motion with a nice smooth transition in between. And that, that's actually kind of a hard thing to do. So uh, we'll cover that as well. All right, got the shot in. And the first thing I want to do, so there's, I got two issues here. One is that I was an idiot and I just put green screen on the, the monitor when I probably could have better maybe left it black or used gray or something. I don't know. So I've got to, I got to key that out. And then I'm going to add uh, some Nerf darts, at least one coming out of my gun here. Uh, flying at the screen. I somewhat regret not actually firing a Nerf dart because it probably would have looked just fine, but I wanted a little more control over the trajectory and also I was a little nervous about falling on my butt. The other thing I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to color correct the shot and clean up some of this really gnarly noise because when the iPhone is shooting at 240 frames per second, it is starved for light and the lighting situation in this room here being all backlit and everything was not particularly ideal. So, uh, I've got a little work cleaning this up here. But, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's just throw the old After Effects camera tracker at it here and just see if we can get a nice camera track off of this thing. So we'll choose uh, Animation, Track Camera. All right, it looks like this is going to take a while. So, um, spoiler alert, it didn't work. 
That is a bummer. So why didn't it work? Well, funny thing about this crazy wide angle lens is that it is a crazy wide angle lens and it renders straight lines not perfectly straight. And that kind of thing can make it really hard when you need to track in, say, rectangular things into the middle of the shot or track CG into the shot. You can really see it here on the corners of the frame. In fact, the type of lens distortion that is present in these iPhone 11 shots is weird because it's actually fairly flat throughout the majority of the shot. And then it just kinks really strongly uh, right at the corner. So what do we do about that? Well, luckily, we were working on a tool to solve exactly this problem as we were working on this video. So coming soon from Red Giant, and I'm giving you a little sneak peek at it here, is an effect called lens distortion. And lens distortion is a really awesome way of not just removing or adding lens distortion creatively to a shot, but building a lens distortion aware workflow for visual effects. Uh, this is something that every visual effects artist knows that they should be doing and probably are doing, but it's always been a little bit cumbersome, required shooting like particular kind of lens chart, things like that. With Red Giant Lens Distortion, part of the VFX suite, you can just do it by just drawing a line on something that is supposed to be straight, just like this. And as soon as you add enough points to kind of really profile the thing, you can either just remove the distortion and this gives you a really good look. Here, I'll turn this on. This gives you a really good look. Uh, see that wavy line there? That really shows you how strange the distortion is in this shot that instead of being kind of your typical lens distortion, it's actually like this sort of mustachey style of distortion. Um, that's because the uh, lens distortion model that we're using is a robust and complex one. So it's actually able to flatten out uh, the distortion here, but that's not actually what I want. I want the shot to be the shot. I want to add CG to it and uh, the screen insert, but then I actually want everything to go back to the way it's the way it was filmed at the end. So I'm actually going to press this other button here, create undistortion pre comp. Now uh, I know what you're thinking. Pre-comps, man. Everyone hates pre-comps. Well, uh, we've been over this before in tutorials. You know, pre-comps suck, except that they're awesome and they totally solve all kinds of workflow problems. So in this case, they're going to make our life so much easier. So let's press this button. And what you'll notice is the distortion is re returned to the shot. And if I go down here, in fact, I've now done some kind of weird jujitsu here where the original shot down here doesn't have any effect on it at all. And above it is this shot called undistorted work. And if I open that pre-comp, in fact, you know what, let's do, let's show off our favorite thing here, the good old flowchart view. So, and let's give our comp a better name here. Let's call this comp the awesome. Let's just look at what we've got here now. So we've got two additional comps. We've got one called undistort, it's the name of our layer, and undistort, and then one called undistorted work. So going all the way back to this first comp, here's where we're doing the undistortion. Now that's all great. Now let's zap forward to undistorted work. Now this is where we can do visual effects in this undistorted space. And the reason this is important to have these two stages of pre-comp here is that in this comp, I can apply things like Kingpin tracker to do the corner pin tracking on the screen or the After Effects camera tracker. And again, spoiler alert, I'm not going to make you sit and watch it happen. The After Effects camera tracker ate this for breakfast, gave me a perfect track with this beautiful circular camera move, exactly what I wanted, and it was awesome. But check this out. If I add something like an orange solid, come on, you knew it was coming, to this shot, let's make it a little skinny in the full height of the shot. So something like this, and we'll put it over here, kind of line it up with this straight line over here. And then go back to our Comp the Awesome where we started it all. Now you'll see that what's happened here is this undistorted work comp has lens distortion applied, and it actually has the invert button checked 
So here are all of the complex lens distortion uh, parameters here. The inverse button is checked, which means we're reapplying that distortion. But, and this is the key, in that undistorted work shot, this layer back here, well, we don't want to distort undistort the layer and then redistort it and double sample those pixels and make everything look a little bit softer. So that layer is automatically set to be a guide layer and the CG, in this case just the solid, is actually reunited with the original layer here. So this is the untouched original layer and here's the redistorted work comp on top of it. So with the just drawing one simple line, pressing one simple button, we've got an, the correct way to do lens distortion in After Effects, and now we can get to work doing all the fun creative stuff here and know that it's all gonna work correctly. All right, so here we are in the actual After Effects project where I did the work. You can see my beautiful tracked camera moving around in its nice circle here. You can also see that I'm in basically that undistorted uh, work comp here. So you can see my kind of mustachey distortion of my shot and my straight lines. You can also see that I've already uh, applied denoiser to this and it's looking really nice. Um, and let's talk about adding this dart in here. So, yep, spoiler alert, that dart is CG. And it is rendered in Cinema 4D, but of course right inside of After Effects. I decided not to bust out an entire 3D pipeline for this. I just used the Cinema 4D render right inside of After Effects. So, Let's look at that dart. There it is. So this is just made inside of After Effects by just extruding shape layers. Uh, probably would be nice to have a texture map. Probably isn't strictly necessary that it'd be hollow at the end, but this is what I was able to cook together. That goes into my 3D animation right here. And there it is. And I even had a version of this shot with additional darts flying at me out of the screen. You can see that here. So there's a dart on a path coming at us right there. And another one here. Boop. But we decided not to use those. All right, so let's get to our hero dart. Now, I'm not going to go into much detail about how I animated it. It's just on a, on a little null and it is kind of aimed and it flies towards the screen. And I just wanted to time it well enough that I could get it to disappear into the screen right at the moment where the screen was kind of getting edge on to the camera. What I really want to talk about is actually compositing this in believably. So you can already see I'm kind of started to comp the reflection in there. This good old Aaron Rabinowitz shooting at me. By the way, one trick that I learned from Star Trek The Next Generation is that when they would do, when they would film the stuff that was going to appear in the view screen, they would cheat the actor slightly, not looking directly at the camera, uh, but they would cheat the actor slightly so that they would look like they were kind of the side of their face that you would want to see more of. It was almost like as if they were insinuating that the screens were a little bit holographic or whatever, but it also just makes the audience more comfortable. So if you actually look back uh, in the pipeline here to where we are putting the screenshot in, I actually asked Aaron to kind of start uh, his choreography aiming uh, where we could see the the camera left side of his face and the gun and then aim and kind of transition over and so uh, Down here in 3d anim You can see so on this side this side of the shot we're seeing this side of his face and around this earlier part of the shot uh, Let's see where is it? There it is We're seeing this side of his face, so it's like just a little Little nice thing that Arn and I worked out together. Uh, I screen recorded him aiming his gun at his laptop camera, and then uh, so I was able to, you know, film Arn's performance from 3,000 miles away, you know, without us actually ha having to hang out together, which is nice. Got my little dart in here. And if I go forward one comp, you can see now the dart is, and the screen uh, are all kind of lens distorted into the proper uh, shape here. And then we're gonna put them together Here's redistort. Then we're going to put it all together in super comp. 
If you know anything about SuperComp, you might think it's a little bit overkill for this project, but I'm going to show you why it's actually not. So the tricky thing about this shot, and you can see it really well on the Nerf gun here, is that part of the reason that it's possible to shoot at 240 frames at HD on a tiny little camera with a tiny little sensor is that we're getting away with murder here. We're probably not using all of the pixels in on the sensor of that camera. You can kind of see some aliasing artifacts here. Now I've already denoised this, so I've tried to clean it up as much as I can, but even removing noise and color noise, you can see the kind of color undersampling of this. So you can see the red of the gun is bleeding all over the place. Also, in order to disguise the fact that the image is lower resolution than True HD, you know, Apple's image processing engineers have added some sharpening here. And so there's like a little halo of over sharpening going around the gun here. And this is really the focus of this talk. I know it's taken me a long time to get here, but even for some dumb little thing like this, I love to like just throw every trick in the book at a compositing challenge. And so let's see what we can do to try to make this dart fit into this shot realistically. I've already got it matted. So you can see that like the dart itself now, it just looks too good, right? It just looks, it's too smooth. It's too clean in this kind of junky shot here. Uh, it, it just, we need to grunge it up a little bit. So taking our inspiration from what we just saw in terms of the gun, knowing that the colors of the background are bleeding over the gun and the colors of the gun are bleeding over the background. Well, that sounds a little bit like light wrap. Supercomp is a great place for integrating 3D layers together. And we think of it often in terms of effects like light wrap, where you're going to spill a little bit of the background light onto the dart. And we can totally do that. In fact, let's, let's just go ahead and do that. Let's apply light wrap to this layer. And it overwhelms the layer a little bit because of the default size. But if we crank down the default size, you can actually start to see eh, it's going to be even smaller than that. Um, you know, this is probably the beginning of something useful to do to this. We can maybe crank up the amount. But, you know, I don't know. For something this size, this is not going to be the defining bit of realism for, for this. This is really much more about comping something that has a discrete edge that needs to feel different in terms of its relationship to the background lighting than the core and this little stick just doesn't have it. But light wrap is a really powerful tool. It's not just for wrapping light per se. Uh, it can do a little bit more than that. So let's leave this one. We can add multiple light wraps here. So I'm going to add an additional light wrap and this one I'm going to set to the color blend mode. So now what's going to happen is I'm going to actually let some of the background color blend over the foreground. So just to start lining it up, I'm going to set the amount to 100. And you can see that that is completely obliterating all of the color in my foreground, but this will help me set the size. So I saw earlier that like five is probably too big. Maybe even three is too big. What about one? All right, so there's one. Let's try this on and off. So now you can see, see that little white halo there? I'm actually making the compositing worse intentionally because I'm trying to get a little bit of the sense that the camera was having trouble resolving the color difference between this gray background and this colorful blue thing. Now, this has got to go in both directions, right? So maybe we'll set the amount to like 75, okay. This has got to go in both directions, but luckily we've got that. We've also got reverse light wrap. So I'm going to use the exact same settings with reverse light wrap here. So what were they? They were 75, 1. Okay. So I'm going to do amount 75, a size of 1, and mode color. And now let's, let's maybe make this 1.5. All right. So turn that on and off. So now you can see that I'm smearing blue onto the background. And if I go forward into some other frames here, maybe we can see that working a little bit better. So I can uh, turn all these effects on and off with this one switch here. So effects off, effects on. So now I feel like, okay, I've started to kind of simulate this chroma subsampling situation here a little bit better. So there's one last thing I want to do, which is to add that kind of crazy over sharpening situation. So let's go back to the shot where we can really see 
what's going on here. Okay, so here again, you can see this halo around this thing. That, that comes from just very coarse kind of sharpening that looks terrible when you zoom in on it, but looks really good on your phone screen and on your TV screen even. So what I've got here is I've got um, the matte uh, of the CG and I've just applied the Minimax uh, filter to it. So just if you look at the uh, uh, alpha channel, you can see there's the CG element pre-matted and then I apply the Minimax filter uh, in maximum mode just to the alpha channel just to puff it out a little bit. So I've got this matte for just the foreground element and I'm going to use that as, an, as a track matte for an unsharp mask effect. So I've got an adjustment layer with unsharp mask on it and you can see now I've got this crazy ridiculous over sharpening going on on the Nerf dart and it matches up perfectly with this. So smudging the color out and then trying to recover that smudginess with this kind of coarse sharpening is what it takes to make too smooth CG look plausible inside a shot that was shot with a consumer camera. Now I mentioned Kingpin Tracker, so 3D camera tracking is not the only thing that gets better when you remove lens distortion properly. It's also super handy for doing corner pin tracking. So with the nice straight lines that I've now got in this shot here, I've, I'm in the undistorted uh, work comp here, I can actually uh, do a really nice job of uh, applying kingpin here. Now, I was able to track some of the frames, but because I shot without tracking markers and with just a green screen, I, it wasn't, uh, and on a shiny reflective screen, it wasn't as effortlessly as I hoped. So there were a few cases where the track slipped and I had to just kind of manually get in there a little bit. And uh, I want to just show you a fun new thing that we're adding to Kingpin Tracker. Again, this is coming soon, a little sneak preview here, which is instead of having to grab each of the four corners and move them, we've actually now got these really cool lines here that you can grab and adjust as well. So I've got a uh, line at the top I can just grab and move and it'll actually move in perspective. So really with just a couple clicks, I was able to just kind of finesse the few spots where I wasn't able to get the perfect track. So just hopping to a new frame here and just grab it, slide it. It's a really, really easy way to kind of adjust this. I can move all, all four points at once if I grab them in the center. And I can actually grab the vanishing point here and move that as well, which is kind of neat. But really the main thing that was going to help me out on this one is just being able to grab just the edge and scooch, scooch it around a little bit. All right, so once the uh, 3D animation and everything is united and comped together, remember that all of this is just happening in the slow motion comp, so everything is just completely slow. So this is fun, but you know, editorially, it's not really gonna work so well, and it's not bullet time. Bullet time is, you know, we gotta speed it up and slow it down and all that good stuff. You know, I've done enough stuff like this that I've actually got a solution to this problem because it is kind of a problem like retiming things with curves or whatever there's there's a fairly nice interface for it in premiere after effects does it in a really technical way with uh, time remapping curves but it can be really hard to just like have a clip play at a certain speed and then smoothly transition to another speed this was something that i took enough interest in that i actually created a tool to do it so let's take a look at prolost speed ramp so this is just a little preset that lets you go into slow motion and then back to real time and then into slow motion again with control over the speed of all of the sections and the transitions in between and the way it works is just a preset that you apply in After Effects and that's exactly what I did so let's go back to our roadmap here and let's go to Retime Repo uh, and you will see that I've got my full 3D composite here and a couple of markers and I'm actually also doing a little bit of like repositioning of the shot some position keyframes as well uh, what happened on the take that I liked the performance that I liked I the reason I liked it so much is the camera moved really fast the re reason it moved really fast is I whacked it really hard with the gun and in the process of doing that the camera actually twisted a little bit on the broomstick. This is maybe one of the downsides of 
not using professional camera equipment. And so I got this uh, nice Dutch angle here. It, it, it's fine, but I wanted to just have a little bit less of it and just kind of repo around on the shot a little bit. Um, all right, so the way ProLaw speed ramp works is first thing you want to use probably is this little calculator here, which was kind of silly. I was just like, okay, I shot at 240 frames per second and I really want to speed it up to 24. So um, what's the <laughs> what's the multiplier there? And of course it's um, a thousand. So, um, so 100% speed is going to be uh, our full slow-mo using every frame. A thousand percent speed is going to be one-to-one -one with the original frame. So I actually never went to one-to-one. -one. I went from a hundred percent, which is, oh, I guess I should explain how, how ProLaw speed ramp actually works. How about that? Um, it works with layer markers. So basically what's going to happen is speed one, which is hundred percent is going to go from the beginning of the clip up until the first layer marker. And then from that layer marker to the next, it's going to use speed two, which is 800%, which is almost real time, a little bit slower. And that's the part where we're going behind my back. I did want to keep it a little bit slow because I wanted you to see the words VFX on the back of my uh, jacket there. Okay. Then we're going back to 100%. So uh, as of this keyframe here, we're going back to 100%. So now we're back to one to one. So for the dramatic fall. And then at the very end, we have a little smooth transition to uh, 500%. And there is no speed five in this example. And then here you get control over the transitions too. So transition one happens in 0.6 of a second. Transition two happens in a quarter of a second. Transition three happens in a quarter of a second. And if you want to see how that works, you can uh, actually look at the current speed. And so here it is. This is actually the result of that expression. So you can see the 100% speed and then the seamless smooth transition leading up to the 800% speed and then another smooth transition back down to 100% and then a lot of 100% and then a seamless smooth transition back up to 500% just so you kind of catch a little extra speed as I'm tumbling to the ground back there. Hopefully you don't notice that I'm falling on a giant pile of uh, sound blankets. Uh, this is really fun to play with and uh, makes it really easy to um, set up a bunch of speed changes because all you got to do to kind of refine it is just slide these little nuggets around and maybe move these little numbers around. There is kind of an issue which is that as you adjust earlier uh, points here, like if I move this point a little bit here, it's going to radically change what frame I'm on here. So that's kind of the funky difficulty of working with uh, speed change stuff. But the end result I'm really happy with, which is I, I feel like it, it feels bullet timey. It starts off nice and slow to kind of establish the scene. You see R on there, you see my Nerf gun in the shot. Then we pick up a little burst of speed as we go around my back. Then we discover that R is still firing and we discover me falling. And that gives it a little bit of extra kinetic energy so that by the time you discover what's going on, you see I'm already in motion, already flying. Now your attention is totally on the Nerf uh, dart. You're not even noticing that I'm kind of bailing in the background, but you get just enough time to notice before we kind of snap back into real time there. And here's the final shot. In fact, I'll show you both versions. Here's the versions with the extra darts, just for fun. And here's the version that wound up in the final piece. All right, so what are the takeaways from this? Uh, other than I'm bored in the house and I'm in the house bored, and I've always wanted to try this kind of low budget matrix effect. Um, well, once again, you know, I encourage you to think in terms of ways that accessible technology, like the phone you might have in your pocket, can uh, kind of flip the script on our traditional associations about production value, right? The amount of money you spend doesn't necessarily correlate to the production value of the final piece. But the other thing I'd suggest uh, is maybe the lesson here is like, even when you're doing something dumb, and even if you're going to be really lazy about how you shoot it, there's really no reason when you have tools like lens distortion and super comp and kingpin tracker, not to kind of throw the book at it when you're putting it together in post. Uh, adding all these little sweetness touches on this dart in Supercomp uh, was absolutely the fastest part 
of this process and the results really look all the better for it. So whether you're doing a big elaborate CG project or just something silly and for fun, you know, don't forget about the fun compositing stuff that you can do to just push it that little extra edge and, you know, use your eye and examine the plate and listen to what it's telling you because it's going to tell you things about lens distortion. It's going to tell you things about chroma subsampling and uh, over sharpening and all that stuff. And there's no reason you can't just simulate all of that using tools you've already got or using tools that we can help you with. Well, this has been really fun for me. I'm sorry I wasn't able to do it in person, but I'm glad I got to share this kind of craziness with you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and enjoy the rest of the presentations.